On the evening of October 23, 2002, a sold-out crowd filed into the Dubrovka Theater, located in Moscow, Russia, and began to take their seats and settle in for the evening's performance. They had come to the theater that night to enjoy a performance of Nord Ost, which was a popular Russian musical theater show. As the first act began and the performance took to the stage, it was surely far from any one of the nearly 1,000 people in attendance's minds that they'd remain in the theater for far longer than the show's expected runtime, and many of them would not leave the Dubrovka theater with their lives. The first act of the show passed without incident, and at approximately 9 p.m., as the second act was underway, a bus pulled up to the front entrance of the theater, and approximately 40 heavily armed men and women disembarked from the bus and stormed into the theater and began firing their AK model rifles into the air. The assailants quickly made their intentions to those in attendance quite clear. They were a group of Chechen separatist rebels, and the audience were now their hostages. They called themselves the 29th Division, and they explained that this was an act targeted solely at Russia as the militants offered to let any foreigners with a passport to prove it go free. During the commotion, some of the performers backstage managed to slip out some windows and escape, but for the other 900 or so less fortunate people in attendance that night, they were now trapped inside the theater as hostages and completely at the mercy of their captors. The militants were led by a man named Movsar Baryev, who used the theater's video recording equipment to record a video to release to the media voicing his demands for the safe release of the hostages. He called for a complete and immediate withdrawal of Russian troops from Chechnya, and called for a completely independent Chechnyan state. For a bit of context, the Second Chechen War had recently officially ended in 2000 in Russia's favor, although many of the pro-independent Chechnya forces continued to clash with the Russian forces that remained stationed there, and while officially ruled by Russia, there were still many active conflicts and hostilities going on in Chechnya in 2002, which Russian forces referred to as mopping up operations. Baryev called for an end to all artillery strikes and air raids in Chechnya immediately, and upon hearing this, Russian forces did cease all artillery and airstrikes in Chechnya. Baryev further explained in the video that the militants had come with the intention of dying, and if their demands were not met in one week, they would kill the hostages and demolish the theater as they had brought with them over 100 kilograms of explosives. He also noted that if Russian security forces tried to intervene in any way, they'd kill 10 of the hostages on the spot. Russian authorities quickly surrounded the building and cordoned off the perimeter. With so many militants and so many hostage lives at stake, storming the theater that night was deemed infeasible. The theater was designed in such a way that it was quite easy for the Chechen militants to defend as storming the building would require the security forces to go through a 100 foot long hallway and up a flight of stairs to reach the militants. The hostages were rounded up into the ground floor of the auditorium and were kept under constant surveillance by the militants. As a show of good faith, the rebels began releasing some of the hostages that very night and by 2 a.m. the next morning, they had released nearly 100 of the hostages, mostly pregnant women, people with serious medical ailments, children, and foreigners. As word spread about the incident, news of the crisis had resonated very strongly with one local resident, a 26-year-old perfume store clerk named Olga Romanova. According to her mother, Antonia, Olga was adamant that she had to do something about this terrible situation herself and help the hostages, so she headed down to the Dubrovka Theater at around 3.30 a.m. to do just that. Olga was a very persistent woman indeed, and astonishingly, she managed to sneak past the police cordon and into the theater, where she stormed into the auditorium and called out for the hostages to overwhelm their captors and fight back. She was quickly gunned down by the militants, who assumed that she was an agent associated with the Federal Security Forces, or FSB for short. Unfortunately for Olga Romanova, she would become the first casualty of the siege, and the hostages would remain in the auditorium at the mercy of their captors. On the 24th, official negotiations began between the Chechen militants and the Russian government. The Russians explained that they had stopped all artillery and airstrikes in Chechnya as demanded, but they countered their demand for a complete withdrawal by stating that a full military withdrawal from Chechnya would not be possible in only a week. They also noted that the militants had not specified a specific area they defined as Chechnya, so even if they did withdraw troops, they would not know exactly what areas they'd be expected to withdraw troops from. The militants were not pleased upon hearing this and called to meet in person specifically with a Russian parliament member named Joseph Kobzon.
The hostages were allowed to, and even encouraged to, use their phones to contact relatives and people on the outside, and the hostages relayed the current mood inside the theater, as well as information about just how well armed their captors were. AKs, grenades, explosives, with every single one of the 40 men and women being armed to the teeth. After this request to meet with Kobzon was made, some of the hostages inside the theater called for Vladimir Putin to meet their captors' demands, as they quickly learned that Mavsar Baryev would intimidate the hostages and threaten their lives publicly when negotiations were not going his way. At 1.20 p.m., as planned, Kobzon and two associates approached the theater and entered the theater to meet with Baryev. Shortly after Kobzon and the two men entered the theater, the militants released a British man in his 60s, and a few minutes after that, a Russian woman and three children were released as well. The reason that Kobzon had been specifically asked for by the militants was that he was also a member of the Red Cross. During the meeting with Kobzon, the rebels demanded that the members of the Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders members come to the theater and be an intermediary in negotiations between them and the Kremlin. Baryev and the militants were apparently pleased after this meeting with Kobzon, as over the course of the day, they set free a total of 39 hostages. During further negotiations that day, the militants offered to release 50 hostages if the current head of the pro-Moscow Chechen government, Akhmad Kadryov, would come down to the theater personally to negotiate with them, an offer which Kadryov did not respond to. Sometime in the afternoon, a lone FSB officer attempted to approach the building, but was repelled by gunfire from inside the theater. As the sun set, and with the siege approaching a full 24 hours, the militants had become irritated once again with the slow negotiation process, and reiterated that they would start killing hostages if the Kremlin did not meet their demands. Sometime that night, a hot water pipe inside the theater burst, which angered the militants who saw it as a provocation, and it had flooded the ground floor of the auditorium, making the hostages' living conditions even more dire than they already were. The orchestra pit below the stage was being used as the bathroom, and I can imagine it was already quite unbearable for them by this point, with the hot water only exacerbating the horrid stench. The tension from that night carried on into the day of the 25th, as the rebels met with various journalists and politicians, reiterating their previous demands and further demanding a meeting with a representative of Putin directly. During these negotiations, the militants agreed to release 75 of the hostages, mostly foreigners but also 15 Russian citizens, if they were accompanied by an official representative of their state, an agreement which the captors made good on. Putin was obviously well aware of the situation at this point, and after meeting with the head of the FSB, a man named Nikolai Petrushev, they offered to spare the lives of the rebels if they released all of the hostages unharmed. The hostage takers quickly refused this offer. A journalist from the Russian NTV did an interview with Mavsar Baryev, in which he said in response to Putin's offer, We have nothing to lose. We have already covered 2,000 kilometers by coming here. There is no way back. We have come to die. Our motto is freedom and paradise. We already have freedom as we've come to Moscow. Now we want to be in paradise. He went on to further explain in that interview, We came here with a specific aim, to put an end to the war, and that is it, he said. Along with the journalists and politicians, a group of doctors was also brought into the theater that day to distribute medicine and check on the hostages' well-being. They noted that most of the captives seemed to be in relatively good spirits, and they were not beating the hostages or threatening them with further violence aside from their initial demands. Many of the hostages reported to their families that considering the circumstances, their captors had treated them well, mirroring what the doctors had observed, and the hostages also noted that their captors had arranged for the Red Cross to bring them food, supplies, and medical attention. Many of the hostages once again called for Putin to meet their captors' demands, with many also calling for an end to the violence in Chechnya now as well. The hostages' families, hearing this from their relatives directly, staged an anti-war protest outside the theater, calling for Putin to withdraw Russian troops from Chechnya. A British man named John Leonard, whose sister-in-law was one of the hostages, said she described the atmosphere as uncomfortable but calm, and that the hostage takers had clearly stated their demands, and that they intended to blow up the theater if any kind of storming of the building were to occur, and she told him that explosives were spread amongst the hostages as well as placed on the stage. He noted that he thought that the rebels had, quote, not been deliberately malicious, however, and this sentiment was shared by many of the relatives of the hostages. Later that evening, at 9.55 p.m., about 49 hours after they had originally stormed the theater, the militants released four Azerbaijani hostages. 
Shortly after releasing these hostages, however, a series of events throughout the night would quickly escalate the situation inside the theater from an uncomfortable calm into a deadly chaos. Shortly after the Azerbaijani hostages were released, a 39-year-old man named Genady Vlock, astonishingly, much like Olga Romanova, managed to sneak across the police cordon and into the theater. Genady was a father, and believing that his son was amongst the hostages, in an act of desperation he snuck into the theater, and then somehow up the stairs and onto the balcony, where he demanded that the hostage takers show him that his son Roman was alive and well. When the militants told everyone with that name to stand up, the man did not see his son, and so the rebels led him downstairs and shot him. This incident shook up the rebels, who began to feel that a storming of the theater by security forces was imminent, and the atmosphere inside the theater became extremely tense. At around midnight, a man named Denis Gribkov, who was a hostage, leapt from where he was sitting and hurtled his way across the seats towards a large nearby explosive device in an apparent attempt to disarm it, fearing that his captors would soon detonate it. A nearby militant quickly opened fire on Gribkov, but his initial burst missed, and he struck two other hostages a woman named Tamara Starkov in the abdomen which severely injured her, and a man named Pavel Zaharov in the head, killing him. The following burst struck their intended target, and Denis Gribkov was killed as well. Zaharov and Starkova were removed from the building by medics, and Gribkov's body was moved to another room. Now that they had confirmed to the outside world that they had killed a hostage, the hostage takers now knew that a storming of the building was becoming even more likely than before. As the Russian forces began to prepare to take action, the media began to report that a planned siege of the building was planned for 3 a.m. that morning, and the militia, who had been closely monitoring the news, frantically prepared for their final stand. At around that same time, two Spetsnaz operatives from the Special Operations Unit of the FSB were wounded by a grenade that was fired from the theater while they were trying to approach the building, and the militia inside the building began firing outside blindly but the hostage takers soon realized that the Russian special forces were not storming the building after all. The actual siege of the building was planned for later that morning, and intelligence agencies had intentionally leaked false information to the media to throw off the rebels, who after being in such a high stress situation for so long, were more likely to relax after they realized they were not under siege after all. The actual raid would begin to take place at 5am on the morning of October 26th. The Russian security forces were well aware of the defensible layout of the theater, and quickly realized that an outright assault would likely result in disaster, so they decided that they would pump a sedative gas into the theater ahead of time to hopefully incapacitate most of or all of the rebels inside. However, they also knew that this would mean sedating the hostages as well, and dosing the gas perfectly for such an operation would be nearly impossible. They readied ambulances and city buses to take the many incapacitated hostages to the hospital for medical treatment afterwards. At 5 a.m., they cut the power to the spotlights that had been illuminating the theater and began to pump the sedative gas into the theater's ventilation system. One of the hostages later described when they realized that the gas was being pumped into the building. It was five or so o'clock in the morning, and suddenly, there was a strange smell. The last thing I heard was when the Chechen shouted, Turn on the air conditioning. It's gas. The theater's director, a man named Georgi Vasily, also recounted how the hostages inside had begun to panic as they realized they were being gas. A panic went up among us, and people were screaming, Gas! Gas! And yes, there was shooting, he said. As they realized they were being gassed, the rebels, who had come prepared with gas masks, dug in and began blindly firing outside. They told the hostages that they should lean forward up against the seat to minimize their chances of being hit in the crossfire. After letting the gas settle in for a bit, at 5.30 a.m., Russian special forces began their raid of the theater. 200 heavily armored and armed special forces operatives breached the theater from various different points, and a fierce firefight began inside. After about 90 minutes of fighting, the special forces breached the auditorium doors where they found the unconscious hostages and some unconscious militants who did not have gas masks, and they proceeded to shoot the militants as they were unconscious. Various other firefights continued throughout the building as the remaining Chechens with masks continued to resist against the security forces. At 7 a.m., the building was declared secured by special forces, and they began to evacuate the hostages from the building, placing them outside on the pavement around the theater to be transported for treatment. 
As the day wore on, the casualties from the incident quickly began to rise, and at 1 p.m. that afternoon, the Russian officials confirmed that 67 people had died in the raid, but that number would only continue to grow. A few hours later, the death count had risen to 90 hostages, and the last report of the day had the official death count at 118 hostages, although they did not specify what the hostages had died from. Two days later, 646 of the hostages were still hospitalized, with 150 of them in intensive care and 45 in critical condition. The final official death toll of the incident was 131 hostages, although many families of the hostages claimed that it was higher than officials claimed and that hostage casualties actually numbered closer to 200 people. As the casualty count rose, the Russian government continued to deny that any of the casualties were caused by the sedative gas. They framed the deaths as the hostages were executed by the militants as special forces raided the building. However, the truth would soon surface about their actual cause of death. Dr. Andrei Seltsovsky, Moscow's health committee chairman, stated on October 27th, the day after the raid, that only one of the 118 reported casualties at that time was caused by gunshot wounds. As it became glaringly obvious that the gas was the cause of a huge majority of the hostage casualties, the public began to wonder, what exactly was this mysterious sedative gas? The Russian government had not made any official statement about what gas they had pumped into the theater that night, and they were extremely secretive about it. This secrecy was one of the major contributors to many of the deaths, as none of the hospitals or medical staff were told what the substance was, so they were unable to render proper effective treatment to the victims. The Russian government was also further scrutinized for how they had evacuated the theater, since the security forces, rather than medical staff, evacuated the facility, many of the unconscious hostages were laid on their backs on the sidewalk in the intermittent rain and snow, and they asphyxiated as their tongue blocked their airways due to being laid flat on their backs. If medical staff were told what the substance was and were allowed to evacuate the victims, the death toll surely would have been significantly lower. To make matters worse, it was later found that 73 hostages had received no medical attention at all, and some of them had reported being robbed as they were unconscious. And while Putin and Russia faced much international scrutiny for how they handled the crisis and its aftermath, domestically his popularity and in pulling increased substantially. After the incident, Russia resumed their military activities in Chechnya and ramped up efforts to eliminate the remaining rebel groups. But that still left the question of what the gas was, and the families of the victims would have to wait years to get answers. More than three and a half years later, the Russians still had not disclosed anything about the gas to the public. On June 1st, 2007, the official investigation was finally brought to a close. The official death count from the incident was 171 people dead, 131 hostages, and the 40 Chechnyan militants. The hostages listed cause of death was. The official report did little to answer the multitude of questions that the families of the victims and the general public still had about the incident, and in July of 2007, the families of the victims filed a suit in the Russian legal system demanding to know whether senior government officials were involved directly with the raid or the secretive gas. Russian officials finally admitted that the gas was a derivative of the opiate fentanyl, but did not specify further than that. This would draw further scrutiny to Russia's secrecy about the nature of the gas, since an antidote would have been readily available at most medical facilities, and almost all of the overdose deaths could have been avoided entirely. In 2012, a British scientist named James R. Riches published his findings from his studies of urine and clothing samples from the hostages. These studies revealed that the gas was a mixture of carfentanil, an extremely potent opiate sedative usually used for sedating large animals such as elephants, and remifentanil, a fentanyl derivative typically used during anesthesia for surgeries. Unfortunately, there is no satisfying conclusion beyond this to this story, and many questions still remain unanswered. One could take the position that the raid was a success, or that it was a total failure and be justified in doing so either way. But the tragedy remains that 131 people lost their lives and over a thousand had their lives changed forever, all because they had gone out for a night at the theater to see a musical that one fateful night in October. Thank you all for watching.